Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to the regular meeting of the Board of Trustees. Today is Tuesday, July 23rd, 2024, for Smith Vocational Agricultural High School. May I have a call to order? Mr. Kaley? Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson? Here. Dr. Bonner? Here. Mr. Quadro is due in. Mayor Ciara is absent tonight. I'll do the uh, commission I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> The mission statement for Smith Vocational Agricultural High School is to prepare students for social responsibility, employment, and post-secondary education through rigorous applied technical and academic programs. Is there any particip participation by the public tonight? Seeing none, participation by the trustees. Moving on. I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the June 11, 24 Board of Trustees meeting. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 I'll turn it over to the superintendent. Yes. Good evening, everybody. Happy summer. <clears throat> Just jump right in. Uh, overall, relatively short report to share with all of you this evening. Um, under instructional leadership, uh, just as a reminder, in the summer we have uh, the admin team does its annual uh, planning retreat. Uh, we have that scheduled for uh, July 30th, so next Tuesday. Uh, that's going to be on campus this year uh, over in the White House. We'll just have our, our general sort of a, an intensive leadership meeting throughout the day, uh, planning for the, the upcoming year, uh, and then that, that afternoon to have some, some team building opportunities. Why did you decide to have it on campus instead yep. of So I actually put a vote out uh, to the leadership team, uh, a couple of diff different options, and consensus was let's be on campus. For you for yeah. soliciting their input. Yeah, of course. That's not my wheelhouse, uh, event planning, so <laughs> I haven't done that. Um, staffing needs, I, I know Mr. Bianca, uh, this week is his family vacation week, so I just wanted to, to update the board on current staffing uh, that we have. Um, uh, we'll be looking for an electrical instructor, a uh, culinary instructor, a long-term sub in culinary, a biology instructor, a paraprofessional, and the administrative assistant to the superintendent. Which uh, so those are the, the current needs that we have uh, at, at this moment. So a busy summer. Under management and operations. Can I, oh, I just ask a question oh, about um, how, uh, I know that you always ask for participation from employees on the um, as part of the hiring teams, um, how with hiring for all these positions, how has that gone? Is it? Are you able to? Oh yes. Have good. Yep. So I believe biology, as an example, the biology uh, position, uh, they had their sample teaching lessons. I think that was happening yesterday, um, and they were having over in one of the, the classrooms. So that was going well. On the vocational side. Uh, they haven't started with the electrical instructor, the culinary instructor. I know today there were some interviews for the long-term sub position, uh, but there's definitely enough interest. And how would you say the, the applicant pools are for the different positions? I think biology was okay. Uh, culinary, I'm pleasantly surprised uh, with the number of qualified applicants. Uh, I haven't looked at the paraprofessional position yet. Uh, electrical is not out there officially yet, uh, probably in the next couple of days. Uh, the administrative assistant to the superintendent, I was pleasantly surprised uh, at the number of applicants. Okay, good. So, keep our fingers crossed. So, so far, so good. Yes. Great. We don't have any accepted offers yet, so it's still early. Right, but knowing that there's good involvement from the staff and a, a healthy habit and pool. Right. It's great. The management and operations, uh, just <coughs> give the board a, a brief update. Uh, I know Mr. Smith is not here as well. <coughs> but just to give the board an update on the horticulture building. So uh, if you've had an opportunity to drive down back or near the, the construction site, it truly is now a construction site. Uh, there's no more parking lot. You'll see a lot of dirt being moved around, a lot of heavy equipment. Uh, but uh, Murphy's Law uh, has found uh, and has reared its ugly head uh, with this particular yep. project. Uh, we do have two issues that we're trying to deal with. 
that have come to light over the last week, week and a half. Uh, we had a weekly construction meeting earlier today to address both of these needs. Uh, I, I do want to thank the overall team, uh, the debate and back and forth and discussion that we've had. Uh, so follow-up conversations since that meeting. Uh, I just want to give the board you know, to be totally transparent on what's going on. The first one is uh, with an electrical issue. <clears throat> so the Animal Science Building, uh, the former Park and Rec building, you know, that white building still down there, uh, the main electrical feed that feeds that particular building uh, comes from the same service panel that feeds most of the complex down back. Uh, most of the official site plans that we had, so during the design phase, we have to know where all the power lines are, and water lines, and sewer lines, and so on and so forth before we you know, agree on a construction project. Um, none of the site plans had the official location of where that power line happened to be. Um, through our best guesses and, you know, and leaning on Tim Smith, you know, we thought we knew where the power line was, um, but again, out of respect for Tim, uh, that was all done well before his tenure as well. Uh, so. Uh, Kiter begins to do the site prep, uh, starts pulling up all the dirt and everything else, and lo and behold, that main power line is literally bullseye. And when I say bullseye, I'm talking bullseye, right through the middle of where the, the new building's going to be. Uh, so that's an issue. Uh, so we've talked about alternatives. Uh, one option was to simply leave it where it is, uh, and there's ways to work around it. I don't get to, into the technicalities. Uh, but it could potentially uh, introduce some issues long term, as you remember, uh, you know, our goal, our vision is to have an expansion of that building down the road when we have more funding to add the head house and the new greenhouse. Having that, that power line under the building could introduce issues then, and not only would it also potentially cause issues if we have, a, have an issue with the power line and it happens to be under a $7 million building, uh, what do you do at that point? Uh, so ideally we want to move the, the wire. Next question is where to remove it. So there were really three options. Uh, during the meeting today, we were talking about two options. Uh, after the meeting, we revisited an original option, which we're actually moving towards now, probably the most cost effective. Uh, but we're talking about running the wire up along the, the football field, uh, right on the edge there, and dropping it back down into animal science. That was one option we looked at. Another option was that we run it all down along the, the farm road. Okay, that's a very long route. Uh, and then the third option that we revisited uh, after the meeting today, which was the original idea, uh, was to sort of run it along the base of the hill, uh, kind of hug the, the new building, and get beyond the new building, get beyond the potential new construction, okay, that next phase, and then get it into animal science. Uh, and the electrician who is on, on this particular project, he actually signed off on that. He thought that was going to be the best idea as well. Uh, I thought we may have a quote this afternoon. I'm sure we have a quote, but it just never got to my level this afternoon, so I can't tell you that. Um, but as you can imagine, the, the price of copper is through the roof, um, and we're just trying to find the most cost-effective way. And, we're, and they're actually looking at uh, going from copper to aluminum, which would be a cost savings as well. So, and what did the engineers think about that, and what did Emma Schmidt think about that? I don't necessarily like that idea. That was Schmidt's idea. To go to aluminum, yeah. And well, we got to do a little homework on that. The conductivity of the aluminum is nothing like copper, I don't think. Um, blah blah blah. But let's yeah. let's look into it. Right. Um, so I know when I was part of the meeting this morning, uh, we talked about the hill, and we had some reservations there. But we feel we can keep it just beyond the hill. The footprint of the building, we got to excavate for the footings and walls, anyways, right? And that was and so. Possible. No matter what's there, we're going to be excavating, anyways. Correct. Right. Correct. Um, okay, and then that leads into your other issue. Um, it. And while we'll let Andy get into that, um, so that that sounds like a, a viable solution. C correct. Uh, so I think we'll have that answer most likely tomorrow. And it, it, in my opinion, it, it, we'd be foolish to leave the line under the building. God forbid we have a problem with it down the road. Yeah, nobody was in favor of that. Right. Right. Um, could you explain to me how um, how it how we didn't know that it was there? So I'm not looking to point fingers or no, to blame a, anybody, but I just 
I wonder how that, you know, this is a piece of public property, right, that there must be some kind of historical records in terms of, you know, like the property's been surveyed. I know if I, you know, if I wanted to build something on my property, Dig Safe would come and use whatever they use to see where the lines are. So the public, the public property basically ends at the top of the hill. So once it got down back there, it turned into what they would consider private property. What, who would consider? Like the city? So or, or Dig Safe utilities. Gotcha. Um, let me jump in here, please. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the design team would do their due diligence, pulling up any records we have. Tim met with them and brought them on board. Um, yes, it's unfortunate. It's a valid question. Uh, everybody, as best we can tell, did their homework. And needless to say, we had a um, so it's kind of unforeseen that, yeah. condition. So it was in that kind of no person's zone where it was. Well, we knew, we knew, knew was there was a line yeah. through there somewhere. But we didn't have really. Um, we thought it was further south, more into the parking lot yeah. side, not where it was. Mm -hmm. And getting to his next issue with the soils, yeah. well, I'll we'll let him go there, but unfortunately, this stuff happens as much as you try to yeah. cover all your bases now and just as a, as a sidebar they're doing this big project it's not a big project but it's an important project to UMass Amherst and they did the same type of thing the whole deal they've just uncovered a contaminated soil with all the testing in the world it did. Mm. it's terrible it's okay mm. I said my piece <laughs> So uh, last, I think it was last Thursday, I was notified uh, as, I say Kiter, uh, Hatfield Construction is sort of the subsidiary of, of Kiter. They're the, the actual company doing the site prep work. Uh, they were doing some digging uh, to prepare for the footings for the foundation, and uh, they came across uh, what they identified as organic matter. Uh, that was in quotation marks. <clears throat> Which sounds like that's what you would expect. Isn't everything organic? Like dirt and trees. And Depends things. on what you want to define as but organic. You know, well, I'm what thinking it's bad <laughs> in this case. Potentially. Well, it, it doesn't have any structural stability for building mm. a building on top of it. It's soft soil. It's so, so, soft soil. Yeah, it's or, organic. So you need inorganic soil. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right. It, Organics meaning like vegetation. Um, mainly vegetation, you know, decayed leaves, twigs, logs, whatever, um, uh, animal waste, you know, my first thought was, was, was it cow, man cow manure mm -hmm. somehow? Yeah. But then again, So you can't build on top of organic soft. Well, we didn't, as no, no, of no, last Thursday, be, last Thursday and Friday, 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 we didn't know. Compactable. Gotcha. Uh, so, so we called out the, uh, environmental consultant that we use to do some core tests during the whole design phase because we want to know what type of soil we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they do drill with like basically an auger, they take some samples and you know that process we did our due, our due diligence, didn't see anything that was abnormal. Um, they dig four test pits mm -hmm. uh, last Thursday or Friday. Three out of the four test pits had this organic matter that they were mm -hmm. they saw that didn't belong there necessarily. So they, we sent it out to, for testing. <clears throat> at today's meeting, we had the company uh, at the meeting, and uh, the organic matter that we identified uh, was basically ash. Um, several feet deep of ash and several feet down. Um, so the question is, uh, is it contaminated or not? Uh, that's question number one. Meaning that it would have to be like removed specially? Removed yeah. and okay. mitigated yeah. and gotcha. talk about money. Yeah. Um, and then question number two that Rick's referring to is just the stability of that to hold a structure, to support a structure. Um, so something was burned there? So, well, there, go ahead. Um, I lived down the road, 100 plus year old house. They had an incinerator in the basement. Yeah. And my garden beds all around the foundation of the house is ash. Mm -hmm. People burned and they just uh, dumped okay. stuff in the ground and buried it. Huh. And that's probably exactly what happened out here. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, back then, uh, coal burning furnaces were more popular. That could be just dumping the ash for that. There, any number of rational excuse, you know, yeah. reasons what, for it. What is the cost to rectify that? That's what we're, we're working on. Oh, okay. 
And what's the process? Like, what do you do? You like remove it and replace it? Yes. So that's, that's ne the next part of my okay. lovely story today. Okay. I mean, it's just it's too bad. Uh, it's, it's not surprising, especially on a piece of property that has this kind of history. But. Mm. So yeah, question number one was, are we talking about contaminated soil? You know, when I first heard organic, my first thought was cow manure, and then my second thought was, with the other things that we're finding buried back there, are we talking about some type of petroleum product? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. well, luckily, it's not the contamination as far as petroleum-based products. Uh, so that's a, a check in, in the wind column. Uh, but the bigger issue is, uh, the experts do not believe it is sustainable for uh, supporting a structure. Um, so now what do we have to do? Um, so in essence, we do have to excavate it out. We have to pull it out. Um, and then we have to bring in uh, new uh, construction, construction fill, construction like fill that will gravel. support the, the foundation and the building, uh, which obviously there's a cost there. Um, so that we are getting a quote on that. Um, <clears throat> one potential cost savings, because we have the opportunity uh, as Hatfield Construction removes this particular soil, uh, if we keep it on property, it can be reburied, and that is okay with all the regulations. Uh, so we are working on what that would look like. I'm trying to find a way to make that happen. Uh, because if we actually um, dispose of it off property, so we pay for it to be removed, we may then have to run into the stipulations of testing it and this higher costs. So if there's a way that we can remove it from the construction site, put it someplace else on the property, but it has to be buried, that is totally legal. Uh, so I am pushing hard that we get that happen. The, the soils expert, Mike Talbot from OTO, <coughs> O'Reilly, Talbot, and whatever, um, <coughs> um, indicated it's it's an ash product, and there's some wording in the regulations in regards to this because it is prevalent in a lot of places that, uh, in general, we say not um, contaminated. It just it's just ash. It's just a bird byproduct of whatever would paper and, and um, can be indicated could be just redistributed somewhere on campus, buried, and we wouldn't have a whole trucking and disposal fee. Mm -hmm. So that's being looked at. Neither of those, neither of these issues warrants considering another location on campus for the building? There is no other no. viable, except knock down. No, it's, it's, it's not, it's not. And my worry, what we're finding in this particular site, what we find in the sure. existing site. Mm -hmm. right? I think. <clears throat> so there is also some debris mixed in that would um, have to be culled out, like some pieces of metal. At one point when they took the tree down, there is what, some type of steel tank or yeah. something? Yeah. Maybe a compressor yeah. tank yeah. or something? Yeah. And thank God that was a petroleum filled mm -hmm. or oil filled. Mm -hmm. um, so that stuff would have to be picked out, which isn't a big deal. So fingers crossed, that's hoping what we're able to do. So one of the options, speaking of that, uh, if you walk the site, you, you see things sticking out of the, you see pipes and you see glass, it's, it's litter um, down there. Um, if we were to reuse, so one of the discussions today was, um, if we were able to somehow still reuse this dirt on the construction site in certain ways, um, we're still dealing with all of this metal and whatnot. Uh, so then there'd be a process to have to sift it through, screen it, uh, and separate everything. Unfortunately, the job site is too small. They can't do that within the job site. And then, then you start talking about moving it someplace else on campus. There's a lot of labor and equipment usage. The cost goes up. Uh, so it's, it doesn't sound yeah. logical, but it's logical that well, it's easier for us just to simply remove it. We can bury it someplace else and we bring in new, new fill and then we can move on. <clears throat> I just, I can't picture it. In my mind, I think we have space down there going towards, what, the orchards or whatever. And, and they, I, I've got to imagine Hatfield 
construction has some type of screen process, screen so I've already mechanism. Used, I've already allowed that spot. If you go down there, there's probably uh, 40. Uh, All right, there's stuff in the way. All the topsoil that they scraped off, there was no, even though they, they had a spot within the construction site to store all the topsoil, it wasn't a large enough site. Okay, okay. So I allowed them to move it over. All right. There's already a, there's not already, dirt down there. Space is already <laughs> taken is what you're getting at. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So that's what was dealt with us, you know, over the last week and a half or so. Uh, I, I want to let the board know. <clears throat> Right now, the early estimate, and this is an unofficial estimate, this is talking to Schoolhouse uh, today. Uh, we are thinking between the electrical movement and the site improvement, uh, we're anticipating probably upwards of $50,000 uh, to handle both of these. Oh, okay. That's a much better number. I was already in the millions. No, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I don't know how much it will cost. No, okay, point taken. Um, and and if uh, I did ask, I texted Andy and Craig, our OPM, during the meeting what our budgeted contingency is, and uh, I believe Craig responded that he thinks it's 250. Is that accurate, Andy? 235, 250, somewhere in that range. All right. So okay. that's that's built into our budget, yeah. and any project like this yeah. needs a two to five percent, even even higher, depending upon how many unknowns you think you might have. But I think we budgeted appropriately. And also in the report, I just have. I'm trying to avoid a contingency fee as much as possible. We're one month into the job, and yeah. I don't want to be dipping into it that, already. That's discouraging uh, to have that. These and issues I, I already rejected a couple of requests that came to me that we could talk offline if, if necessary. So I'm trying to save that as much as possible. Uh, but there are some other potential credits slash cost savings that we've already identified that I just want to share with the board um, to hopefully put our minds a little bit more at ease that uh, one week into construction basically we have this major issue here potentially. But uh, we do have a, a cost savings in the, the fiber optics run uh, as a shorter run than initially anticipated. So we are going to get a credit on that. I can't put a dollar figure on it. Uh, the second one is a sprinkler design. Uh, SMMA, which is our the architects, uh, they've asked Hyder, uh to price out some alternative options around the sprinkler design, more on the classroom side of the building. So again, remember it's ba a basic rectangle, one side is shop area, the other side is classroom area. Uh, they think there's a way to redesign the sprinkler system and save some money there. Uh, so we're waiting on, on those estimates back from Kyder, uh, but we do anticipate savings. Uh, and then uh, the generator. All right. Um a little confused by that one. The sprinkler uh, coverage is well defined by code. Mm -hmm. um, so, what are they thinking? Um, and, where and how did it come to their attention? SMMA internally was reviewing the designs and trying to see if there's other ways to save some money. Gotcha. And this was one. Uh, so, right now, the classroom side uh, basically you'll have your drop ceiling. Uh, and then the sprinkler system is basically up overhead. Uh, they think that might be ways to treat the uh, that side, treat the uh, the trusses, uh, so to be more fire retardant, uh, so we can cut back on some of it. Uh, I think there's three or four different options All right. that, that they've identified. Uh, as of today, they asked Kiter, uh the project manager from Kiter, if he's had an opportunity to price it out. He was honest and said he hasn't had a chance because he's been dealing with these two, other two issues. All right, so if they has SMMA uh, put forth a uh, an official change order request? They, or they put forward these four options that would pass all code, and they've asked Kiter to come back and please quote, Okay. give us a quote for these four. So it's formally done. It wasn't just kind of talked no. around the table. Correct. All right. So well done, SMMA. Really Hopefully, yeah, we appreciate yeah. that. We'll yeah. they're paying, that they're paying attention to it. Right. And then the generator, the way the generator is working out, we think there's going to be a cost savings overall uh, with that particular piece too. So um, that's some positive news. Um, any questions on this as of the horticulture building? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, we'll keep you updated as time goes on. The Companion Animal Building, uh, we are probably in the 11th hour uh, of completion. Uh, if you have a chance to drive down back, uh, the retaining wall is just about done. Uh, we've had two times that we've run out of the retaining 
wall blocks. Uh, so we're waiting for the final delivery. Uh, Tim and his crew have been actively raising the elevation of, of the outdoor run uh, so that we can get the fence up. So that's moving along, it's looking great. If you go inside, uh, as of today, they were, well, this week they've been doing all the trim work around the, the windows. Uh, we're still waiting on a delivery of some of the, the plastic fiber board that we're going to line the walls to be more uh, water resistant. Uh, the electrician was there today installing outlets, so we're moving along. And who's about. that? Uh, we usually uh, use Orchard over this Orchard, morning. yeah, Orchard. Joe, Joe Kachowski. Uh, and talking to Tim this morning, uh, we are on track to, to be open for the fall. Um, we are doing the floor with that epoxy floor, uh, so we're hoping to do that in late August. So, The same system you use down here in Correct. Animal Science. Yes, yes. And they should be experts in that now. They had a little learning yes. curve yes. from last time. Right. And it all came out well. Yes. So they did automotives related. They did coll uh, collisions related. They, they, after they did, they did, did After they did Animal? The animal came after, but they... They learned some lessons there. I know that. Yes. Okay. Definitely. Um, are you thinking about having um, like a ribbon cutting ceremony for the building? I think that would be sure. spectacular. Like that. The, like it's such a point of pride yeah. that it was done Absolutely. internally, and yeah. you know yeah. Tim leading it and yeah. to celebrate the accomplishments yeah. of everybody that contributed to it. Yeah, yeah. we got to take the accolades wherever we can. Yeah. Absolutely. We like that. Good news. Yeah. And it is something to be Invite, really invite the press, invite the TV station, you know, we got it, we got the word out. Right. So that's some good, uh, some good news there. And then finally, as of this morning, uh, the sidewalk project around B building has officially begun, uh, and that was being paid for through the city capital improvement. So um, you'll see uh, a new beautiful sidewalk around B building before you know it. Are they using granite curbs? They are, yes. They're everywhere in the city. Yeah. yeah. So those were delivered there in the side parking lot. So, yeah. yeah, if you can go granite curbs, it's the way to go. They last longer. Mm -hmm. they, they take a beating. Uh, Precast concrete curb will, will fall apart. Blacktop curb even worse. Mm -hmm. um, but, you, you know, there's an upfront cost, but I think the life expectancy of the granite is probably cheaper in the long run. Mm -hmm. Looks good too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So family and community engagement. Uh, I want to thank the leadership team. They are working around the clock uh, to finalize all of the opening of school activities. Uh, so before you know it, we'll be back. And uh, I already mentioned the, the admin retreat that will be happening next week. So we'll, we will outline uh, the newsletter topics for this coming school year. <coughs> Uh, back before the school year ended, uh, I just want to report out to the board that I was invited to present to the MDAR, that's the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture and Resources, uh, th their board meeting. Uh, all of the ag schools were invited to present, uh, so it was a great opportunity just to, again, showcase the vocation of what we do um, and then listen to the other Aggies as well. Uh, what was surprising to me, unfortunately, was the number of board members that were completely unaware that there were ag schools in the state. Uh, so it was an educational opportunity for us to inform them that we, we exist. All right, how many are there in the state? There's uh, four. Four? When you said you spoke to the board, I was like, I, like that it has a board, and I'm like, oh, like Desi has a board, MDAR has a board. Right. So who is on the board? Is it? Um, so uh, Commissioner Ashley Randall is the? Right, of course. Like, so, Exactly. And Commissioner. And I'm not sure how uh, the individuals who spoke, there were a couple from Western Mass. They, they seems to me, mostly are all involved in the agricultural industry, so farmers of some sort. Um, and and you you're saying they some were some came out and said I did not know you folks had. existed. How about that? <laughs> well, great for you for going and yep. raising the awareness. All right, um, I'm done. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, MDAR, Mass Department Agricultural Resources. Resources. Okay, that's a state agency. Yeah. Sure. And we know who Ashley is. We had her out here. That was great. Right. And you said there's four Aggies in the state. Are they combination like us? 
There's only two of us that are a combination, and there's two that are truly county-based, only ag. Two combinate, and where are the two oh. ag only? So Bristol County, it covers Bristol County. That's sort of South, South Shore. Um, you got Norfolk County, so basically the next county north. Uh, again, sort of south of Boston. And then you have Essex North Shore, Boat Tech Ag, very long name. Uh, All right, now who, who were the two um, agging only? One, Bristol North County North and Norfolk County. And Norfolk, okay. And so Bristol's further south, South yes. Shore. Yes. And then next up, above it is Norfolk. Yep. Okay, thank you. And then the two combos are us and then Essex which is northeast corner, Danvers, Gloucester. Uh, and they're the ones sure. that got that fancy new building somewhere in Bristol also get? They both do, yes. It's like, like Shangri-La. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we just can't believe. Yeah, Br so Bristol's presentation at this same MDAR meeting uh, is just amazing what they have now through the campus. Well, I've been there a few times before the construction project was done, and uh, Bristol reminded me a lot of Sniff very old New England style architecture, uh, both sides of the road, campus feel, um, but it was definitely old, but a great school. Uh, and now they just, it's beautiful now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and same with that, Essex. Essex is relatively new. I think they opened the new campus in 2014. Yeah, uh, it's beautiful. Okay. okay, thank you. The last day of school, uh, again, with this being a family and community engagement, I can't thank the, the PTO enough. Um, and, and Joe and I talk about this a lot. At the high school level, we oftentimes have very minimal input from and support from <coughs> PTOs. And our PTO has to be one of the best. Uh, and I can't say that enough. Um, they put on an amazing luncheon for the staff. Um, and what's amazing is most of the, the PTO members are parents of former students. But they just they stay on. They continue to, to support the school, which is great. Um, so I'll put a call out to you know any new parents who want to you know, join the PTO to support. But uh, they do a great job. So thank you to them. Uh, and then lastly, I want to thank Dr. Spencer Robinson. Uh, we met with the mayor uh, and finance director Nardi um, a couple weeks ago now, <clears throat> down in the mayor's office, just to begin the conversation that we had at the last board meeting uh, around D building. You know, what is the potential around a D building uh, construction? Start strategizing on, on some of those options. So uh, I think it was a good, healthy about an hour, hour and a half long meeting. So. <clears throat> so professional culture. Uh, uh, excuse me, sir. Yep. Um, any outcome from that meeting? I know it's very preliminary. I'm going to report on it when we have committee reports. Great. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Unless you want to. I'm sorry. No, no. I, don't mean to. I think it's probably a better time. So under professional culture, I, I've had the opportunity to attend two conferences uh, since the, the last board meeting. The first one is the <coughs> Success Conference, that's through LAVA, uh, that's our annual uh, conference held down at Assabet Valley uh, in Marlboro. And uh, I just listed out uh, the sessions I was able to attend. And, uh, you know, the first one was revitalizing a struggling CTE program. And it was fascinating, uh, the presenter was a, an actual uh, CTE instructor. And many of his suggestions and recommendations our recommendations that as an admin team we've talked about. Uh, so it was great to hear the same recommendations, but it was from a, a different perspective. It came from a teacher and his experience of being hired to go into a program that has been struggling. So from the vantage point of a new teacher in a struggling program, how does he succeed? How does he, how does he overcome those struggles? Uh, and it was a really interesting uh, session, so I was, I was happy to be there for that. Uh, we also have our, our MAVA Board of Directors meeting uh, at the conference. It's the last one of the year. Uh, so I am now officially off the board. I'm not off the board. I'm officially not an officer anymore. Uh, thank goodness. Uh, and then uh, I was able to attend. We had two teachers, several teachers attend the conference, but two of them actually presented at the conference. And I wanted to attend both sessions just to support the teachers and we'll see how they did. Uh, the first one I attended was from Mr. Brewer, one of our criminal justice instructors. Uh, that's the session he uh, he presented on basically collaborating. Uh, how do you engage uh, the students? And uh, he, he did a great job. Uh, the attendees really got involved. A lot of laughing and joking, but a lot of very simple strategies uh, that he he shared with uh, the 
attendees, so that was great. Uh, <clears throat> Building the Future, the Better World of the Construction Craft Laborers Program. Uh, that was an interesting session. Uh, this is sort of part of the, the Mass DOT apprenticeship program that we have here on campus in the fall. Um, the Mass DOT uses uh, a training facility in, in Hockington uh, that is owned and ran by the, the Construction Craft Laborers Union. Um, and it was an interesting session. It was great. I, I, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I then attended a, a session on proper planning for your retirement. And then lastly, uh, the second teacher who was presenting was Ms. Daniels from, from Cosmetology. And uh, I was definitely a fish out of water, um, but I was learning about hybrid lightning cosmetology techniques. And, and she did a great job too. Uh, I, I, I was impressed. Uh, it was a smaller turnout because it was very uh, obviously industry specific to cosmetology uh, compared to Joe's was more broad. Uh, but I, I think she did a great job. Uh, Great discussion with the other cosmetology instructors that were there. So uh, I applaud both of them. I have a question for you. Um, speaking to this sort of larger um, uh, aspect of your work, um, so can you tell us a little bit about why you wanted to be a MAVA officer and what that experience was like for you and why you're glad you're not anymore? It seems like you're glad. I'd like to know, especially about why you wanted to take on the leadership role. I was voluntold. Oh. Uh, I'm sorry, you were what? Voluntold. <laughs> okay. That's a word. By a previous president? <laughs> no, a, a oh. previous executive director. Right. And basically said, Andy, you're taking the I think lead. you'd be great. We'd love to have your voice. You're a great person. But great you have to consent. I mean, you have yes. to, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. So tell us why. I think just getting involved at that level, uh, having a voice in an ear at the state level, I think is very beneficial. Um, you know, obviously, I think it's been a very contentious time period in the state around CTE. So having that, the ear in the voice of the, of the commissioner at the time, you know, Jeff Riley, uh, having more personal connections with the, the DESE staff, uh, attending those meetings, having them here on campus, uh, I think is very beneficial. Uh, so, my own personal professional growth as a superintendent, I think, improved. Uh, but I think just my ability to advocate for the school and then bring information back to the school so we can try to stay ahead of the curve, mm -hmm. I think, was beneficial. Nice. And what will, will be your relationship to Mama going forward? Besides so I'll be a, a board of director. So, <clears throat> the, their bylaws state that uh, all superintendents of the vocational schools or CEOs, because. Um, you know, we do allow the comprehensive schools to be members of MAVA, so think about a Westfield Tech or a Chickadee Cup. Mm -hmm. and they're, a member, they're a school in a larger public district. Yeah. Uh, oftentimes that superintendent would not be going to a MAVA meeting, mm -hmm. uh, so they oftentimes will designate either the CTE director or a principal or somebody from that vocational school to be part of it. So we're all, uh, board direct, we're all members of the board of directors. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll still be attending all those meetings, have a, have a say, but I won't have the smaller officer meetings with the, the DESE staff. Right. So it's sort of like with the Collaborative for Educational Services where the board for that is made up of a school committee representative from every single member district. That, yes, that's probably the, the best analogy, yeah. yes. <clears throat> yeah. All right, I'm going to piggyback on uh, Dr. Gooley's questions. Um, so your, your term is up. Could you have done another term, or is there some bylaw against it? No, so the bylaws are set up where you, when you're nominated as an incoming officer, uh, you become the, the secretary that first year. And then, I'm not going to say you graduate, because I think each of the jobs are very important, uh, but you progress through all of the officer mm -hmm. roles. So, the secretary, the treasurer, then, it, then you're supposed to be vice president, and then president-elect, president, and then past president. Uh, but during my tenure, uh, yeah, we went through an executive director change, um, and there was some turnover because of that, and uh, we had a resignation from an officer, so I skipped a year. I skipped that vice president skipped the year and became president elect. So uh, a six-year commitment turned into a five-year commitment. It's a really good model for leadership training. Yeah. Yes. A lot of those. Does, yeah. does MASS have the same kind of? No. Well. They have, I know they have the president, past president. And they have vice president. Um, I'm not sure how many vice president, yeah. Yeah. 
We just heard the nominations at the conference. I know, I didn't uh, really pay attention. So the, in, the new incoming vice office. president happens to be a superintendent from a vocational school. So nice. uh, we will have a voice at the end. Which school? Okay. Old Colony. Great. So, okay. Okay. So the, the next conference was last week, speaking of uh, MASS. This is the, the, the larger superintendent uh, association for the state. So these are the sessions uh, I was able to attend. Uh, really, the, the basic difference in, in methodology between uh, Connecting for Success and the MAS, MASS conference. Uh, Connecting for Success has one smaller keynote and then a lot of breakouts. Uh, and MASS is sort of the opposite. You know, there's a lot of sort of uh, centralized general sessions in the auditorium. And then more in the afternoon, you may have some breakouts uh, if, if you get to those. Um, so. The first keynote was Dr. Manny Scott. I'll come back to him. Uh, I have a few videos I want to share with the board. Uh, and then, again, using data cycles to create sustainability and raise equity, access, and leadership. Uh, that was sort of a case, not a case study, but sharing out from a particular district. Uh, the acting commissioner Johnson, uh, Russell Johnson, uh, came down and, and uh, shared some updates from DESE. Project 351. Uh, Project 351 is a student organization. Sort of their, their, their vision is that you have representation from all 351 communities in Massachusetts. And they do a wonderful job uh, every summer down at the conference. Uh, it really is a highlight to, to listen to the students and, and what they're doing. It's a neat <coughs> program. It, yes, it right. really is. Uh, another keynote was Amanda Ripley. Uh, she's a renowned journalist. And her focus was around high conflict. And really talking about conflict, and uh, there's a difference between good conflict and that conflict in essence, and, and sort of digging into that, and what is the difference, and how do we as leaders and district you know, leaders and school committees and boards of trustees, how do we you know, deal with that conflict? So uh, she had a lot of great insight. Uh, another session was a learning with and from one another, advancing equity for students. Uh, this is around the diversity work that we're all working on. Uh, so that was nice to get some updates and some, some ideas. Another one was getting the message right during the crisis. Uh, this was put on by one of the uh, public relations firms, and um, just, you know, as life happens and things happen within a district, how do we get messaging out uh, during that particular crisis? Uh, so that was, uh, I think, some good ideas. <coughs> we had the opportunity to receive some updates from AASA, which is the National Association, uh, so just the updates from Washington, what's happening uh, when it comes to just schools in general, and uh, funding and whatnot. There was a session on negotiation strategies. Uh, I think most districts, uh, you know, this is one of the things that we all have to work through. Uh, so what's happening across the state. And then another session uh, that I was able to attend was the Secretary of Education, Tut Weiler. You know, he's always a great presenter, uh, student focused. Uh, you know, he, so it's always nice to listen to him and his updates. Uh, so I, I want to go back to, to Dr. Mini Scott. <coughs> So I'm going to give you a, a quick synopsis of who he is and, and three very short videos just to, to allow you to hopefully get a better sense of what we were able to experience. So there was a movie back in 2007, Freedom Writers. Um, Hilary Swank, I believe, was uh, the actress's name. She was a lead actress. Uh, she was based on a true story. Uh, she came from a very wealthy family. Uh, her father, I believe, was general manager of the Anaheim Angels back in the day. Uh, she was supposed to become a lawyer, uh, and then she decided, I don't want to be a lawyer, I want to be a teacher. Uh, so she became a teacher, an English teacher, and she got a job in one of the worst high schools in the, in the L.A. area. Um, and she struggled uh, on how to, to connect with the students, and, uh, and how did she create that engagement with the students, and she finally figured it out. In, in essence, she became a student of her students. And uh, she started winning them over, and the students became, the, you know, started coming out of their shells. And uh, you know, one of the students in that first classroom was Mimi Scott. And his story, uh, I won't speak a portion of that. I'm sitting in the back and I'm literally just, I'm crying. Uh, his story was that impactful. Uh, what he went through as a young man, uh, drop out, went back, so on and so forth. And obviously you see there's a doctor in front of his name, so uh, he, he found his way. Um, so he was amazing as far as just the story in general. He was amazing as far as his presentation skills and his theatrical ability uh, to, to really share his story. 
Um, but then some of the points he made towards the end of uh, as educators, as administrators, what can we do? Um, you know, how do we find the meaning Scots of the world basically in our classes or in our shops? And, and they're everywhere. Okay. Um, and he kind of ended with uh, this message <coughs> around being salty. Uh, because it was interesting, as he's presenting, uh, I was thinking to myself, you know, he, great message, great point, but how do we get students to buy in? Okay? And, and I've, also, I've oftentimes told teachers that uh, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Okay? And I'm literally thinking this during the presentation, and then he talks about that. He talks about, you know, I know, you, know, you can lead a, a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. Um, so then he talks about you know, one of his presentations out in Texas. Long story short, uh, there's an analogy. Uh, there's a rancher out in Texas who raised his hand and said, you know, but you, you can give the horse a salt lick. Uh, and the idea is, yeah, you can't make a horse drink. But if you give the horse a salt lick, what's going to happen when the, the horse licks the salt lick? It's going to get thirsty, okay? And then the horse wants to drink. So as educators, as administrators, we need to be salty. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, sort of his, his yeah. analogy. Uh, so, <clears throat> Enough of the background. I, I do. Please bear with me. Uh, one second. Uh, what was the name of the movie? You're going to see it in a second. Freedom Raiders. Freedom Riders? Yeah. Freedom Raiders. W R. W. Yes. Okay. I'm going to play the, the trailer so you can go home tonight and watch it. Mm -hmm. And then two short videos. One that kind of gives you the, the synopsis of his presentation. You can kind of get the, the sense of, his, of the feel. And then lastly, sort of his, his explanation of the assault. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to show you? Uh, I don't think so. I think we can. What if they could jump? Oh, that turned off. That's fine. Oh, that turned off. In Long Beach, it all comes down to what you look like. It's all about color. If you're Latino or Asian or black, you could get blasted any time you walk out your door. My name is Erin Buell. Schools are divided into separate tribes. I'm not sitting near him. I can't go back there alone. Man, I know you ain't talking to me. We kill each other over race, pride, and respect. We fight for our America. So what you're saying is, if the Latinos weren't here, or the Cambodians, or the Blacks, or the Whites, or whoever they are, if they weren't here, everything would be better for you. Lady, stop acting like you're trying to understand our situation. Why don't you explain it to me? We in a war. a first-time teacher. You can't make someone want an education. Listen to me, all of you. Stand on the line if you've lost a friend to gang violence. Stand on the line if you've lost more than one friend. Three. Four or more. From this moment on, the person you were, that person's turn is over. Everyone has their own story. We're going to write in these journals. There's no place like this out there for us. I can't go back to the way it used to be. Nature. I can't. Nobody listens to a teenager. And they don't see the wars we fight every day. I don't even know how this is. We have something to say to people.
no matter how dire the circ dire the circumstances, no matter how dysfunctional the background, no matter how much trauma or brokenness is going on at that kid's house, when that kid shows up in your class, in your presence, you can jump in front of his or her trajectory and alter it forever when you see me. How do you reach that kid, the one who needs a whole lot of extra social, emotional, and academic help. The one who is disengaged, despondent, sometimes disrespectful. How do you reach that kid and kids like that so that that kid can succeed in school and graduate prepared for work in life? That kid is in your district. What could you say? What could you do? What must you or your staff understand? Who must you be? to reach that kid and kids like that. If we don't reach them in positive ways, they will eventually reach you and the ones you love in negative ways. I used to be one of them. My hope is by the time I'm done, you are reminded that no matter how hard your circumstances, no matter what you think is wrong with your system or with this state, no matter what imperfections and inadequacies you feel you have, who you are right now is enough to alter the trajectory of a kid's entire life. Who you are. By the way you love them, by the way you humble yourself, by the way you let them see themselves through your teaching, by believing in them until they believe in themselves, who you are is enough. Someone's future depends on you. On you. That's why you lead. That's why we fight. That's why we're still here. That's why we show up even on your worst day. You are your student's best hope. Be salty, it, be salty, it, it grows out of part of my presentation and really out of a lesson I learned. You often hear people say, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And I've learned that while you cannot make it drink, what you can do is give it a salt lick. If you give a horse a salt lick, It'll lick that salt lick, that salt lick will make it thirsty, and it will therefore make the horse drink. And so in the same way I tell people, be salty. Be salty for the people you want to help, the students, the individuals, the community that you want to make a difference in. Uh, be salty and inspire them to be thirsty so that they can long for the wisdom and the knowledge or just more out of life. Okay? Be salty. Good morning, church. How are we doing today? <clears throat> so part of me felt a little bad last week as I'm listening to him. He was supposed to wrap up his, his session around 9.30 or so, I think it was. And, uh, there, then there was going to be a short break. After that, the conference is building these breaks to force us to go and talk to the vendors and you know, interact with them. Uh, at 10 o'clock, we have our weekly construction meeting. <clears throat> and I already told the team I'd be hopping on. Uh, you know, via the teams and online, and, and Helen Fiantini, our lead architect, she was actually at the same conference, and you know, she was one of the vendors. <laughs> and uh, 9.30 came and went, and 9.45 came and went, and uh, I'm thinking, how do I leave this, this session? I am literally crying, and he is he was so powerful. Um, and then about 9.55, he's still going, and I'm like, well, I'm missing a meeting. You're yeah, missing a meeting. meeting. <laughs> That's <laughs> way more growing. So he went out for a while, but it was, but yeah. Helen attended the meeting. She did. And I was there. Well, we, we had the experts for us, right? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that was nice. Um, just a couple things uh, towards the end here. We do have a donation uh, that we received for electrical. Uh, Universal Electric Company donated uh, a whole bunch of uh, wire, conduit, conduit fittings, and, and lighting control devices to be used for the students, uh, which is great. Recently in the news, you know, this is the, the, a look back uh, in the Gazette. 25 years ago, uh, the dairy farm at Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School is now one of 50-some farms statewide to be recognized as a dairy of distinction. 
The honor was awarded earlier this year as part of the Massachusetts Dairy Farm Beautification Program. So, uh, which is great. I'm not sure when uh, the school ended its dairy operation, but it's been within the last 25 years. That's all I know. And then looking ahead, uh, again, I think all of you are well aware now that we have these weekly construction meetings. You know that uh, the Avon team has its planning retreat next Tuesday. Uh, the following day, we, you know, the Board of Trustees, we're going to have our strategic planning retreat. I have a Density Commissioner update call uh, on August 1st. Uh, that following week, I'll be down at Devon's uh, for the MAVA planning retreat for a couple of days. And then before you know it, uh, we're back at it. So Wednesday, August 21st is the new staff orientation. Thursday, August 22nd, uh, all staff return for their first day uh, work day. Um, yeah, that Friday, the 23rd, is new student orientation. That weekend, uh, so Thursday through Sunday, is the Cummington Fair uh, that is uh, supported by the admin team. We come back that following Monday, and that's the first day of school. <clears throat> that Friday, August 30th, there's no school, which will give actually a very long weekend uh, for the staff. Uh, that is Labor Day weekend, uh, is the Three County Fair, uh, which will be uh, staffed by uh, staff from the school. Monday, September 2nd, uh, the campus is closed for, the, for Labor Day. Uh, Tuesday the 3rd, there's no, uh, no school because of the primary elections. And then mid-September, uh, we've scheduled the back-to-school night. I think it's a Thursday, uh, September 12th. Uh, so we try to, we do look at Northampton, we look at Hampshire, some of the, the largest ending districts uh, to see if we can avoid conflicts. Uh, we call it back-to-school night. Uh, most dis districts call it open house, uh, but we don't call it open house because our open house, that first Sunday in November, when we bring in the community and prospective families. Uh, so when you hear back-to-school night here at Smith, uh, you can think about open house in most districts. And then lastly, uh, Tuesday the 17th is uh, the next scheduled Board of Trustees meeting, uh, assuming that there's not one in August, but we can talk about that later. With that, I'll turn it back to the Chair. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, principal's report went out, Kevin, is it? No, there's no principal. Here. And I, I mentioned the, the staff update. Uh, yeah. Not much. Yeah. That's correct. Julie, you have a committee report? Yeah, and I um, should have said this during the, um, the announcements um, to let you know that I went to the MASC Summer Institute. I was been consumed with the superintendent evaluation, which will be, um, I'll be sharing tonight. Um, the, I'm, I'm never disappointed with the MASC events. They're just, they're, they're dynamite. Um, so the first session I went to was on strategic planning. It was excellent. I had great resources. I'm looking forward to sharing those with Dr. Lincoln Hoker. Um, on Thursday, I went to the collective bargaining session, which also uh, the two presenters, uh, both attorneys who work with different suburban districts, urban districts, phenomenal, one MTA, AFT, essentially. Um, and then I also went to the, uh, it was a, the whole group, the general session was on crisis communication, which is probably the same presenter, Chris Horn. And oh, he, yeah, he, excellent. He, he's done the MAC. Um, uh, the conference that we go to, the joint conference in November. Um, it was just great, you know, great. And it actually made me think about how well our team does in terms of crisis communication um, already, which is nice. Um, so the uh, the debuilding strategic uh, planning work that Dr. Lincoln Hoko referred to, um, we, we at our last board meeting, we said we wanted to, the next step was to meet with the mayor and the city finance director. So um, that's what we did. We filled them both in on the challenges presented by D-Building and um, went into some detail about potential solutions. And as um, Dr. Lincoln Homer said, it was informative uh, and, and collaborative. And, and an hour and a half, of, about half an hour longer than I, I planned on. Um, Dr. Lincoln Hoker and I agreed that we want to share part of the reported presentation of the 2015 Donahue Institute report at our retreat next week. So I shared that resource with you all after our last board meeting. Um, you know, the Donahue Institute is part of UMass. They did a study of Smith Oak um, now almost 10 years ago, presented it here. Uh, and then there was a discussion that was facilitated by then Senator Rosenberg. So we, um, we are. Uh, we want to share that part of the recording during our retreat, so that 
um, we have a shared understanding among all of us about the challenges and in that discussion the next steps were clearly identified um, which we may want to consider okay um, you emailed me something in regards to that all, all of the trustees yeah it was an email correct yeah it was the about YouTube the video okay yeah. all right so, so I got a <coughs> We're going to watch. Um, we're going to watch, watch that some of it next or the week. whole thing. We're going to watch the discussion part. The first part is a presentation report. And All right. So it would be wise for me to do a little homework. Definitely, if you wanted to, for yeah. sure. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So it's got a lot. And then you sent that right after our last meeting. That's I think, right. Right. Yeah. I can right. send it to you. No, me. I can find it. Okay. I'm going to ask you to send it so it's on top on my email. Sure, and don't feel that you have to watch it because that discussion really captures the findings of the report and the challenges and the you know potential solutions. Um, but if you want to get wonky and, and hear from the, the folks who did the research, all right, I got it right here. Uh, June twelfth, Porsche. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we go overwhelming. We did not have a policy subcommittee. Mm -hmm. So we're all set. Yeah, and we so we will, as promised, continue to report to the board anytime we do anything related to the building. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Julie. Appreciate your effort. Yeah. Thank you. Pre yes, sure. exactly. I did all that comment. The soldiers reporting. I mean, you went over. Yeah, I went over this main thing. So I spoke to Tim this right. morning, so I shared. And your finance report is in the packet, so we can review that. All right. Uh, I just want to follow. Uh, backtrack a second. You mentioned the sidewalks. That said, which building? B. B building, where the gym is. Where the gym is, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, and our new business may have a motion to second to approve the 24-25 faculty manual update. So moved. Second. We're going to discuss it, yes. Discussion. So I will uh, point you to, in your packet, uh, Mr. Bianca did prepare some of the highlighted changes. <coughs> Ms. Lynette participated. Was in attendance, yes. yes. Uh, so, thank you. So, as you can see, uh, up, updating the calendar and dates and, and whatnot, uh, updating page Stop numbers, the rent, yeah. getting the, the new school logo, and then uh, adding the vision of the graduate. This is part of the NEAC work. So, what you see there is uh, the whole description that centers around the vision of the graduate. I'm very happy to have this in front of us right now because that should absolutely be in the front of our minds uh, at our retreat, right? Yeah. Yes. On the back side, uh, there was <coughs> this is outlining uh, when staff have to be at campus. Okay, we just wanted to sort of emphasize the attendance email uh, that we use uh, when an individual leaves campus and then arrives back on campus. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, uh, this is sort of twofold, uh, and this is how I share with the staff. One is obviously for HR purposes. Uh, if we have to account for various accruals, you know, we need to know when staff or office are off campus. Uh, but in a more, from my perspective, in this really came to light a few years ago talking about crises. Uh, you know, we had a gas leak uh, out on Route 9 and we had to evacuate down to Northampton High. And as you can imagine, it, it can be very difficult, more difficult at a vocational school with multiple buildings, not really knowing who's on campus. Okay, um, So having this email thread that we can quickly retrieve all of the attendance emails and see who's either on campus or off campus at any given time in the school day from my vantage point, it's more of a, a school safety uh, necessity. Um, so we've been doing this for several years, but we just wanted to make sure that staff remember you know, when we leave and return back. Uh, this avoids the need in the olden days. Uh, you probably recall, uh, you'd have to go to the main office and sign out, okay? 
we, we avoid all of that because again, I might be an animal science instructor down back. I'm wasting more time trying to get myself to the main office to sign out. I can just do my quick email. I'm gone. Quick email when I get back. So the practice is um, has been that folks email when they leave, but not necessarily when they return. The practice was you email when you return, but we just try to emphasize reminding them. That I mean that the pra oh. practice, not the policy. Oh yeah. So the policy was email when you return, but the practice not so much, and so you want to make sure that you know, whatever the intention was. Um, who monitors that email account? So there's several of us that receive the attendance email. Okay. Uh, so those who need to have a record of it receive that email. Gotcha. Yeah. That definitely mm -hmm. makes it easier than, especially on campus size, exactly. than having to exactly. Yeah. And then this last one was. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's an opportunity to focus on AI. I don't honestly have a whole lot of backstory on this one. I can try my best. Was there, um, where did the language come from? Do you happen to know? Like, did, was it created by our team or does it, because it can be really helpful when an organization proposes language to use. I, I, I don't have an answer for you, honestly. That's right. That's true. I think it's great that we are um, bringing it, uh, giving it some attention. Right. Yeah, giving it attention. We are adding this too. It's, it's, it's part of the policy in terms of cheating, and um, it just goes to show that you know, in terms of using AI and what the limitations are. So, okay. so this is so this is in the this is in the faculty manual about student use. Staff are expected to monitor student use. Do we have a policy about faculty use of AI? Like, are, can faculty use AI to grade student work? We don't currently have a policy that would include that. What about in North Hampton? Yeah, we don't have a policy for that. It's more so on the, the students. Yeah. What I've read in Education Week and other kind of publications is that it can really be helpful to teachers, ironically. I, ironically, Less when we right? Yeah. 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 But that would be a use that it kind of makes sense for versus students generating their own Original authentic work. Yeah. 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 If it can help a, a teacher create a unique uh, plan, teaching plan, or whatever, yeah. um, that they may be thinking outside the box they never thought of. I think that that was realized during the pandemic time in terms of the use of the different apps and creating those types of lessons that would be uh, engaging to students. Yeah. Who, um, who would, it, would it be um, Mike and Melanie who would, what, so I'm, um, I'd like to, but I'm potentially interested in understanding faculty use of AI. Um, the extent to which they use it, the characterization of yeah. it, like are they using it for lesson plans, are they using it for grading, are they, using, are they not interested in it, would they like to know more about it, do they, do they have no interest in it. Um, I'm not saying that, I, I'm not putting the request out there formally, but it would be interesting to know that. I'm sure Perhaps one of the school spotlights? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. and okay. maybe, yeah, just to sort of take the temperature of what, what is the current use and what is the appetite among the faculty um, for more, if, if, if any. Great suggestion. Okay, so going back, we have a motion a second to approve the faculty manual updates. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. We have tabled the, until September, the facility use rate updates. And that's for, for outside for yeah, for hiring and the gym and for the uh, building. Yeah, okay. Why why have we tabled that or postponed it? Uh, the Chris Crystal's not here. Into it a little bit more and, and she's yes, drawing down on it. Yes. Okay. <coughs> I have a question in regards to that. Now that is the church whatever it is, religious entity using facility on Sundays at 10 and that's still active and ongoing yes. and do they pay a fee? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
May I have a motion to second to approve? I have to read all these into the record, so bear with me. The following surplus from Animal Science for Resale is graph of boot wash from collision repair for resale a metal bending brake and a Miller make it welder. From physical education for scrap three treadmills, four elliptical machines. From horticulture for scrap, a Kubota three point hitch bale mower, a BMB three point hitch scrapper blade. Little Wonder 11 leaf blower, Billy Goat leaf blower, wood splitter 24 inch capacity, Kubota tractor, diesel tractor, four wheel drive, B7100, a Cub Cadet 33 mower dual blade 10.5 horsepower, DR done right, field and brush mower, a Bobcat mower, Kohler 14 HP horsepower walk behind, Four three-point hitch, 930A, five-foot mower, atta five mower attachment. So moved. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Mr. Kaling, did you did we skip yeah, over the voucher one. who came in at this year, 24 invoices? We forgot the invoices, buddy. Oh, did I? Yep. Sorry. Where's the problem? I was going to say something. Thank you. May I have a motion to second to approve payment FY24 invoices? So moved. Second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? So uh, I see you're using Green Environmental. Um, Adam Lesko? Yeah, I, I meant to try to get the context for that one. I don't have the context. No, he's, he's a good guy. Um, he, his dad was at. Uh, with college facilities back in the day. And, uh, I've done some work for me back in the day. Like, you know, there's some things you don't need these big time firms for, and he's perfect for it. I've met him a few times. Because. So may I have a motion to second discussion, possible action, a vote on superintendent evaluation? I, I don't think we make a motion yet. Okay. I think we will have to share. So all right, I'll turn it over to Julie. Okay. Um, so what I am about to share with all of you is a draft of the um, superintendent's evaluation. So I welcome your feedback, your input, of course. Um, it's a composite. So my aim was to combine everyone's evaluations into this, this one report for all of you. And I hope each of you can yourselves in the evaluation. Um, I'm happy to answer questions, explain the ratings. That, that's, the ratings were uh, pretty easy to do. There was pretty pretty good consensus, widespread consensus among us, but all, all five of us. Um, so I've got, uh, we've got to read this all because it's a you know, public record. We have to read it all, so I'll do that. I've got one for each of you. I'll take one and pass them on. One for Dr. Lincoln Humphrey. It's not, um, it's not exactly like the destiny rubric, which is pretty complex. We might use that on the next round, but and then there's one for Ms. Carter. Right so starting us off right at the top here, the first page. So it's an end of cycle summative evaluation draft report, and you can see it's prepared by me, aggregating the individual evaluations on behalf of the board. So if you want to look at your first page there, Right at the top, the overall rating for Dr. Lincoln Hofer is proficient, probably not a surprise to any of us. Um, and, and proficient is, is, is highly complimentary, right? Like Dr. Lincoln Hofer is doing really well at his job. I've got the goals here on the first page and then the standards on the other pages. So goal one, by June 2024, 17 monthly newsletters will be shared with families in the community highlighting various aspects of Smith Folk, including academics, vocational programs, student supports, athletics, cooperative learning, and informative articles educating the greater community around Chapter 74 and career and technical education. The newsletter we use is some more platform enabling easy translation and data analysis to better understand those that read the newsletter and adopt, adapt the newsletter for greater impact. Um, so the composite rating for Dr. Lincoln Hooker on this is significant progress. 
Um, I think the uh, thinking was that it, it wasn't the goal of 17, but well on its way. And, and lots of compliments for the newsletter, which you'll see when we get to the narrative. Goal two, by June 2024, 20, 18 of the monthly superintendent's reports uh, to the Board of Trustees will include specific information that informs the Board of Trustees of current units of instruction, projects, and topics within the academic and vocational programs. This shared information will assist the Board of Trustees when accepting a budget and creating or updating pertinent policy uh, consensus that Dr. Lincoln had uh, met that goal. And uh, this was definitely seen as a strength Dr. Lincoln Milkers, as you'll see in the narrative. Goal three, by June 2024, the policy subcommittee will have been reestablished and priority policies will have been identified to review or create in order to ensure, been identified to review or create in order to ensure policy coherence related to the hiring, retention, and benefits of all school personnel. And um, that goal was met. So standard one, instructional leadership. The education leader promotes the learning and growth of all students and the success of all staff by cultivating a shared vision that makes powerful teaching and learning the central focus of schooling. The composite rating for Dr. Lincoln Hoker in the standard is proficient. Here are the comments. Dr. Lincoln Hoker supports high expectations for all students and accommodations for diverse learning needs in a number of ways. The departmental spotlights provided evidence of the use of pedagogical and professional practices to provide equitable opportunities for grade level and skill-based learning, which would be an elder. As staff shared about their respective disciplines, the project-based learning and the incorporation of the content areas within the respective shops indicates engaging and inclusive instruction. Implementation of project-based work demonstrates opportunity for students to problem-solve real-life situations. The superintendent has overseen the expansion of course offerings to include art, Spanish, and advanced placement in several content areas. He's advocated for adequate staffing in special education and school counseling, as well as the opportunity for students to earn the state seal of biliteracy. The superintendent ensures that the board is thoroughly briefed on annual MCAS scores and understands the district practices in place to promote student achievement. The NEASC accreditation process is a recent example of Dr. Lakenhofer's support for school administrators and instructional staff in a process of observations and feedback from an independent evaluator. And a direct quote from uh, one of the board's individual evaluations is, I appreciate the way Dr. Lincoln Hoker always was quick to credit and acknowledge his team, which is evidence of a strong leader. It's clear that he values and respects all students and their individuality. Um, yeah. go ahead. You were about to say something. I was just going to say moving on to standard two. All right. Um, can we have any discussion in regards to this? Well, we're... I went through this and... This is the first time we're all seeing it together. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I struggled with it, as you know. Oh, with the with your own individual evaluation? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I read this, and I say to myself, boy, that sounds exemplary. <clears throat> so... I don't know if this, correct me if I'm wrong, if this is the place or not to discuss it. What would make this him exemplary besides what we see here? I, I will share my own professional experience as an educator, and then I would um, I would call on Dr. Bonner to contribute to the extent to which you're comfortable doing it since you have participated in so many evaluations. So as it, within the educator evaluation system that the state requires um, educators to be involved in, which is not required of the, the boards can do, the school committees can do their own evaluation. Yeah, yeah. doesn't require it, but they do require it for Catholic educators. To be exemplary, you have to be a model in that, of that standard, essentially statewide to your colleagues where you're helped. Proficient means you're doing everything really well. Yeah. It doesn't mean like you're just okay. It means you're doing you're everything do, really yeah, well. You're doing the Ex okay. Yeah, exemplary yeah. means that other people in the field, in the field of education, K-12 education, vocational uh, education leadership, would point to you and say, you okay. are a model of this. Dr. 
Thank you. I don't really need to add to that. I mean, I think you stated that, but there's also a rubric that we use in the DESI model, and it will give examples of what is considered to be exemplary versus proficient. Um, and it, it really is the above and beyond. Yeah. You know? Okay. And that was Thank part of, um, we had those descriptions as, the, for our individual evaluations, there was like a short narrative for a proficient exemplary the other two categories. So when we were looking at Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. So I'm glad, do you want something? Yeah, I, I mean, I would not advocate the other exemplary standard one. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and, and I well, guess, hey, this is new to me, okay? I'm learning. It's my analogy, and Dr. Spencer Robinson is correct. On the educator's rubric is about modeling, and that's not necessarily the superintendent's rubric. But I guess my analogy, as I'm, I'm listening to this, um, my ability to work with the administrative team and be as successful as we are as a school is because of the team in instructional leadership. It's not because of Dr. Lincoln over here. Because I have such, such a strong team, all of this is able to come to fruition. If I had a weak team, I could not hold the school together under instructional leadership. That's just being open and honest. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other areas where I think I'm stronger personally and professionally that I could probably lead more directly, and even if I had a weaker team. So it's not te the rubric doesn't talk about modeling or, or whatnot, but uh, I'm very grateful for what is said here. Uh, but I'm, I'm not exemplary. And and I want to <coughs> yes, call out uh, what you have just brought attention to, which is. It's so impressive. It's really wonderful, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. And you'll see that in the next standard. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So in the next standard, standard two, management operations, <coughs> learning and growth of all students and success of all staff by ensuring a safe, efficient, and effective learning environment, using resources to implement appropriate curriculum staffing and scheduling. And the composite evaluation of Dr. Lincoln Hoekler here is um, exemplary. His, his focus indicator was uh, were, in, indicators were environment, law, ethics, and policies, but exemplary for the overall standard. Dr. Lincoln Hoker's greatest strength as a leader is in district management and operations. He has a clear vision for updated, safe, and a, an updated, sa updated, safe, and appealing learning environments for all students, and is able to effectively direct human and financial resources to achieve that vision. The design, renovation, and construction of the horticulture building, the companion animal building, the animal science building, and the pocket pet lab are all evidence of the superintendent's leadership in this area. These campus improvements will provide a wide variety of opportunities for students and a relevant environment for vocational learning. In addition, the partnership with a local clinic to provide a school-based health center shows the importance of student wellness as a necessary element of students' academic success. The campus-wide key fob security system is an important contribution to student safety, while air conditioning and new windows help create comfortable instructional spaces. Dr. Lincoln Hoker has an exceptional understanding of state and federal education law and policy and collective bargaining agreements. He models appropriate compliance with these and ensures that administrators and educators comply as well. And two quotes from the individual evaluations are, I applaud Dr. Lincoln Hoker for balancing everyday requirements of the position as well as additional duties of facilitating major construction projects on the school campus. And from a different evaluator, you cannot put on paper every internal decision the superintendent makes daily. I want to point out that taking on the projects over the years, not just the latest large $7.5 million construction work, the daily requirements of the local Locust Street campus and other SVAHS properties are full-time jobs. Exemplary. Exemplary. So I hope you're taking that in, Dr. Lincoln Hooker. It's quite a list of accomplishments. Should we take a break? No, you can continue. I can look at it. Right, just quick because we don't have a quorum. Right. Yeah. All right, all right. I'll be back real quick. Yeah. <laughs> I can move fast on this thing. Recording.
standard three, family and community engagement, uh, promotes the learning and growth of all students and the success of all staff through effective partnerships with families, community organizations, and other stakeholders that support the mission of the school and district. Um, Dr. Lincoln Hooker's focus indicator was communication, and in this standard, the composite rating was proficient. The monthly newsletter is an excellent example of Dr. Lincoln Hooker's regular communication with families about the overall educational experience at SVAHS. It is culturally proficient because he has chosen a platform that can be translated into multiple languages. It is also a tool to brand and market the school. Professionally, Dr. Lincoln Hooker re represents a school both locally and statewide. The superintendent takes advantage of every opportunity in the larger community to persuasively advocate for vocational education generally and Smith folks specifically. He uses a program advisory boards and family-centered events at school to foster positive relationships with these constituencies. The network Dr. Lincoln Hoker has created with community-based organizations, nonprofits, and businesses are pivotal to providing contacts, apprenticeships, and internships for students to have experiences in the trades. Two suggestions for next year are for the superintendent to collect data around the number of recipients accessing or reading the newsletter and to create a website that better showcases the vocational and academic offerings at Smith Oak. Um, it's regularly updated with school-related events and news and is easier to navigate. And a direct quote from an evaluator, the superintendent is actively engaging with community stakeholders to bring attention to what Smith Oak has to offer and always make sure that the school gets its fair share of resources. <coughs> And then the um, fourth and final standard is professional culture. Um, the super, uh, sorry, the standard is promote success for all students by nurturing and sustaining a school culture of reflective practice, high expectations, and continuous learning for staff. Dr. Lincoln Hoker's focus indicator was again communications, and the board has rated him as proficient. Dr. Lincoln Hoker's written communication with staff, families, and the board is timely, clear, and informative. One example of this is the emails related to specific events on campus that require broader publicization. His verbal communication at school events for families is welcoming and appropriately appropriate, and he consistently portrays Smith Folk in a very positive light. He communicates effectively with staff, with the staff at faculty meetings, with both written and verbal presentations, and they appreciate being kept informed about district issues. Dr. Lincoln Hooker conducted a staff survey to reflect on leadership professional practice concerning all four indicators. Dr. Lincoln Hooker networks with other professionals and participates in MABA. He served as a former officer of this statewide organization. He's demonstrated how he keeps abreast of pertinent topics to education and especially vocational training. The superintendent reaches out to the relevant stakeholders when considering important decisions. And two quotes from different evaluators are, Dr. Lincoln Hooker's reports at the BOT meetings are well done and informative and keep us up to date on ongoing issues. And he does a good job of giving his professional opinion, but also asking the board to give their thoughts. And then the last page um, speaks to the reciprocal accountability that um, I wanted to include in this evaluation process, which is um, not just um, us saying to Dr. Lincoln Hooker how well he does, but for us to have a chance to look at ourselves and say how well are we doing in supporting his leadership. Um, so in what ways did the Board of Trustees support the superintendent to meet standards and goals? Overall, the board is supportive of the work that Dr. Lincoln Hooker has been conducting. We allow him to do the work that he was hired to perform and stay within the confines of our role as a support system, fiscal advocate, and governing body. We are also involved in one-on-one -on -one decisions with the team on discipline, meeting with parents, and solving problems to support the staff and keeping the students' needs number one. On standard one, instructional leadership, the board supports the superintendent and the staff and students by engaging in the curricular presentations and celebrating and attending ceremonies and competitions. There's sometimes heated dialogue regarding his proposals and nothing is rubber stamped. Through the budget approval process, we voted to fund the positions to allow for adequate staffing in areas to meet students' diverse needs. You're welcome to contribute your um, input, Dr. Lincoln, because we go through these all at the end. Uh, for standard two, management operations, the board has trusted Dr. Lincoln Hooker's vision 
and work to help him move forward the new initiatives. We established a building and property subcommittee and a policy subcommittee to support the superintendent in meeting the two focus indicators of standard two. These subcommittees allow the board members to contribute in their respective areas of expertise. We also partnered with Dr. Lincoln Hooker in strategic meetings with community members to advance this work. Standard three, family and community engagement. We attend school and community events with Dr. Lincoln Hooker, participate in the MASC Day on the Hill and MASC MASS annual conference with him, and support his inclusion in quarterly department, department head meetings with city and school departments. The board voted to move forward on community partnerships with a school-based health center and the proposed animal control building. We suggested the idea of a monthly newsletter and provided ideas for topics. Standard four, professional culture. Board members are attentive and actively engaged during the superintendent's monthly presentations. Decisions are made collaboratively at that level with the superintendent emphasizing that it's not his call. He has an opinion and a recommendation, but it is not his decision. Board members are available to Dr. Lincoln Hooker as needed to discuss any important issues between meetings. Well done. Thank you. I don't work. You all did actually, it was hard, but you all made it easier because it was, you all gave me good material to work with. Um, so what was written there does not sound like me because it's all of us knitted together. You wordsmithed it. For sure. <laughs> no. For sure. I can see where I was in there yeah. and, and good. could pick out good. maybe who said something. Good. Um, but you exactly. did a great job wordsmithing it. I no, it's part of it of the record as far as doing evaluation for him. Yeah. If we vote on it, then that that's in the record that it's been done. Exactly. So yeah. I, and then I would change the I would take off the draft part and I would add that L to the learning, the typo, fix that typo. And then where, where, where did the oh, I'll draft it. Uh, where's the typo? <laughs> Say that talk about yeah. it. We will need to make a motion to approve. Please. Mm -hmm. Motion the second for possible action or actually a vote on the superintendent evaluation. I'd like to make a motion that we approve uh, the document as presented with the minor correction of the L. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good job, Julie. Thank, Thank you again. You're welcome. I do want to say, like, um, just what a pleasure it was to work with Dr. Lincoln Hoover on this. We, it was a collaborative process. It was the first time for both of us doing this. And I'm, I, I, for me, it was very professionally rewarding, absolutely. And I really appreciate the time that the board took to do this, because that was no small feat. No, it was, it was no small feat. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so glad. It, it's a testament to Dr. Lincoln Hoover's leadership and our support for it that we have done this. I concur. Please. Please. Yes. Please. Please. I'll just first begin to say it again. Thank you. <clears throat> and not necessarily thank you for such a positive evaluation, which is always nice, um, but thank you for the opportunity to do the evaluation. Um, I think as I, I listen to Dr. Spencer Robinson go through the draft and you know, now with the vote, I feel myself invigorated to to even try harder because now you know. I think sometimes you, you do your job and you know, maybe you're going on, on a trip somewhere. If you don't necessarily know your, your destination, sometimes you can get lost. Okay? Uh, and, and having that destination of what this process looks like, um, and my mind's already spinning as far as next year, what can we do from the get-go uh, to make it even better. Um, so thank you. Awesome. Um, it's quite a record of accomplishment, and I feel like um, when people are doing a good job or a very good job, an excellent job, people will just say that and it's so important to name all of the things no. that they are well, doing. Well you documented well. everything yeah. and that's like you said a verbal word is it, yeah. gone once it's out of your mouth yeah. but when it's documented like this it's a it lot. tells a story it does. of this gentleman and yeah. his educational value what he's brought to this school yeah. he keeps saying to everybody when he stands up it's the best job he's ever had and he's not leaving I'm going to take him to task on that because this makes him look like to be available that everybody would want to steal him from us. Mm -hmm. And I have to put out that voice that you're staying in. 
find it invigorating inspiring. It's awesome. That's great. Yeah, that's like, but I, I hope part of it is is the support of the board yeah. that's mm -hmm. helping that process and those feelings. Yeah, I, I feel this particular board, and I know you know life goes on, and, and board members unfortunately turn over, and superintendents turn over, but. Uh, this particular board, uh, you each bring uh, something to the table. Uh, you each have a, a skill set, st strengths, and you, you hold me to you know, accountable for those, which I really do respect and appreciate. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, Chairman. Future business. July 31st, we have our Board of Trustees strategic planning retreat here in the library at 12 p.m. September 17th, regular board meeting, 5 p.m. in the library. September 18th, the general advisory committee meeting, 7 a.m. at Oliver Smith Restaurant. October 15th, regular board of trustees meeting. October 16th, program advisory committees meeting, 6 p.m. in the cafeteria. And I have to ask, I have to oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I want to advocate for Ms. Barrett for a second. <clears throat> so. As you can see, we don't have an August meeting set, and I strongly support that. Um, but there is an outside possibility that we may have uh, more invoices that we have to have approved uh, between now and the next board meeting. And uh, I just want to put out to the board for discussion uh, how we want to handle that. Uh, I think there's ways to handle that minus an official board meeting. There may be a way electronically, uh, if we have a packet, get it out to the whole board, you can review and approve, kind of like we do with the contracts. Uh, or we set a meeting, uh, and that meeting could be very specialized, it could be very quick, it doesn't even have to be at 5 o'clock. But uh, I just want to make sure that from the business office perspective, right. we can continue to pay the bills. Yeah, we had a brief discussion in the last meeting. So I like your suggestion of trying to figure this out remotely in some way. But we'll do, I, I will do what I need to do to make this happen. Well, I think the packets is the way to go, and then we can, we can uh, get your name, okay. whatever, once you get back. I'll give you a second. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Of course. So, um, All right, come on. Oh, I'm okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Second. Second. So move. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Putting them away. Mm -hmm.